Welcome to the Peak Mental Performance Podcast with Joe Shalero, optimizing your mental health and athletic performance one episode at a time. Two, one, and all right. Today I have with me Dr. Lonnie Lowry and Kelly Lowry. Dr. Lowry is a exercise physiologist and nutrition professor who I've known for a number of years now. Uh, He also is one of the hosts of Iron Radio. Um, So he has kind of experience not only in his own area, but talking to a lot of experts in other areas, which is kind of the theme of what we've been doing here. And then his wife, Kelly Lowry, is a licensed uh, professional counselor who works a little uh, more specifically in the rehab setting, but in that area of mental health and counseling that really feeds into a lot of the things we're talking about. So thank you both for taking the time to do this today. I really appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So, so um, um, the first thing I kind of wanted to, to touch on a little bit, and this probably applies to Dr. Lowry uh, in your setting, would be, you know, in your, you've obviously done a lot of, in the practical world of training, um, I mean, you've competed in bodybuilding, you spent a time a lot around, around a lot of athletes and lifters, and then you've also done a lot of in the research side, which is your primary job. Um, how have you seen, not necessarily just mental illness, but just athletes' mental perspectives and mental status and the, kind of their mental approach, how does that play into their physical performance in some of the settings that you work in? I don't. Well, yeah, I don't because I don't do a lot of one-on-one type of uh, counseling with athletes, right? As you point out, I, I'm sort of a, a lab rat, or I'm in the classroom and that sort of thing. So a lot of a lot of it is um, rather than mental health affecting performance. For me, it's more like uh, you know how your lifestyle drives your mental health and and you know right. that sort of thing, right? But uh, I would think from a, at least from a uh, a personal perspective, like from competitions. Is that yeah? There's a there are a lot of uh, frankly sometimes a little deviant kinds of behaviors and uh, aberrant mental states when you see people who are competing. It just calls for such a, a, a to the average person extreme level of discipline and concentration. You do sort of walk a fine line with things like eating disorders or uh, body image issues. You know things like that. I can tell you being backstage with people who compete who compete. After a 15 or 20 week diet of chicken breast and broccoli, you know, <laughs> or even more rigorous than that. I mean, I spoke to one guy once. All he did was eat chicken every day for a year. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> meal, no broccoli, no chicken, no chicken. And I'm like, oh, boy. <sighs> but it's funny to be back there because the academic in me almost sort of. And not in a disrespectful way, but I'm just curious. I feel like an anthropologist living among some other culture. And so I want to question them, like, why do you do that? And how does that make you feel? And, you know, stuff like that. And I think uh, one takeaway is that when you do compete, if you're going to do a many-month buildup to a competition, especially, I think, physique competition, you're not in the same mental state you were uh, at the beginning. You know, you're you, you're not really always addressing – things as rationally or from a position of, of strength uh, that you you that you you once were because you're barely eating, your sleeping might be suffering if you're using pre-workouts and you know leaning on the coffee really hard and you know, the diet and just everything involved, the constant training and um, so to me, that's where I see that, right more than more so than on the academic side, it'd be more from the competitor side that uh, a lot of people uh, they're they almost need the experience of competing a few times before they can truly, you know, and sort of master it or even enjoy it for some people because of that mental state maybe that, you know, that extreme preparation phase sets. You know, it really sets that almost biochemical stage in their brain uh, in a sense. So that's where I see mental health affecting performance you know you'll see people do stupid things at the last second ruin a 15-week diet because they think they could just get a little bit leaner you know or they'll do something on stage something on stage that's just kind of bonehead and i think it's because of of their mental state yeah it makes a ton of sense and you know and it's interesting how complex it ends up seeming to be and a lot of the conversations that i've been having 
you know, we've kind of some of, especially some of the lifters that I'm closer friends with that we talk on a regular basis, we've kind of seen, you know, how like in the past, uh, Chad Ikes, who I believe you guys have had speak on Iron Radio before, he's been, you know, diagnosed with bipolar in the past and I've been diagnosed with OCD in the past. And we've talked about like how these different aspects of some of the things that we've dealt with have in some ways been a part of what has allowed us to be successful in some of these areas of iron sports but at the same time you have the negatives of when they start to be patterns that negatively affect your life and it's very complex dynamic and we've talked about this idea of like of like you can't you can't start to hate yourself as a person when you if you're dealing with mental health issues because some of the things of your characteristics have probably lent themselves to to being in the performance area that you are, as, as I'm sure you know with bodybuilding and the same with other strength sports, they're not quote unquote for normal people all the time. And yeah. um, and I think there's a there's a positive aspect to to having very kind of um, very dialed in uh, tendencies, but obviously there's a downside to that as well. Um, for and I think kind of like to your point that you said before of seeing how um, the training and different lifestyle things affect mental health, um, Kelly, in your in your job when you address with these with some of your clients of these issues they come to you with with rehab and mental health and addiction, how do you see see not necessarily in particular to exercise but just generally lifestyle? How much does does your client's lifestyle play into some of their situations? And is that something you address in, in your practice with them? Um, I see it quite often and I most definitely do address it. Um, consider the drug addiction. They often ignore nutrition, sleeping, all in search of the drug or in using the drug. So, Mm -hmm. It, when they are in recovery, they're trying to fix the mistakes that they made in the past with ignoring all those things because then they have other uh, physical health issues. So it's, again, it goes back to that biopsychosocial. Yeah, it makes, it really does make sense. And I, I've seen that in my own experience of not necessarily with addiction, but you know, over the last 10 years, as I worked through some different things, I had been to like three or four different doctors. And um, until recently, the past year or two, hadn't had a lot of success with solutions from that area. And a lot of the doctors I went to, you know, I ended up getting some benefit from some of the medications I tried to help me with my sleep and things like that. But, you know, a lot of times I think people want to just look at it from one area of, okay, I'm going to go to the doctor. The doctor will evaluate this aspect of my symptoms. And then they're just, you know, if the solution ends up being um, for symptom management ends up being like an SSRI or different medication like that. A lot of times people stop there. And I think you see people, at least from what I can, at least from what I can gather, that fall on one end of the spectrum or the other. They're like, oh... You need to be all lifestyle medication and medical interventions are bad, or they fall on the other end of the spectrum where they go, all it needs is the medication and then nothing else needs to change. It's out of my control. And to your point, I think I've come to realize the importance of, I think anybody that talks to me of about, hey, I have these issues going on, I've recommended to them, like, yes, go to a doctor, but also go see a counselor and also address kind of from a coaching standpoint, this is where I can help a little more address your lifestyle of like for lifters, let's look at your training program and see the collective stress you're putting on your body from a week to week basis and things like that. Cause I think while one area of your lifestyle may not be the complete reason you have a mental health condition or an addiction or something like that, I always refer to it to people as like stacking the cards in your favor or building momentum. It's like you have enough little little things that start to add up and if your diet's bad and you're training too hard and you're not sleeping all of a sudden that compounds and you kind of find yourself in a place you never thought you would have been and I'm sure you see that with addiction a lot of times too oh absolutely and and even 
adding to what you were just saying, your whole thought process. Are all your thoughts positive or are they more towards the negative? You mentioned uh, being diagnosed with OCD. If you learn to focus on the positive aspects of it, it will work to your advantage. And then you learn, I always say, learn the workaround for the negatives. How can I make this fit into what I'm doing positively for myself? Yeah, I think I think that makes that's a really good point. And I think that's where talking to a counselor and talking to somebody who's objective like yourself is really beneficial for people because you learn to find the small victories. And I think the same goes and Dr. Lauer, you could speak to this in training too. You have to if all you care about is the one time a year on stage or on the platform, you're going to get very discouraged. You have to learn how to find the little victories throughout the year. And I think the same goes for mental. And that's something Chad Ikes and I have been talking about a lot is the relation between physical training and mental training of you have to find little quote unquote PRs of, oh, I slept a little better this week. Oh, I, I got stressed out during this conversation, but I came out of the manic state a little quicker than I did last time. And I think there's so much importance to finding those little victories and little PRs, both on the, both on the physical and the mental side. And I'm sure, Dr. Lowry, you see that in the training world as well. Yeah, it's self-awareness, right? And even in nutrition, like, for example, I would do weight management clinics for people. And people obsess so much about, you know, they get this mistaken message, I think, from magazines and the media about, oh, I'm going to lose 18 pounds this week and all this sort of calorically impossible nonsense, at least when it comes to body fat change. And instead, we would say, you know, um, a PR for me is I I went from eating one serving of fibrous vegetables this week to three, you know, like literally something you can quantify and, and monitor as opposed to just body composition, which we both know is takes months to really meaningfully change. I mean, on a visible uh, scale, you know, somebody to say, oh, Joe, you look much leaner or, or did you gain like 15 or 20 pounds? You probably had to gain that much for other people to even notice. But one thing you can feel, but one thing you can feel good about as a victory this week is, you know, I, uh, I did in fact find a way uh, that I enjoy to eat, uh, you know, another two or three servings of, of vegetables. You know, if, if that's not something you normally do. And it's just like that with training too, right? It doesn't always have to be a, uh, I, I added 20 pounds to my squat, but it could be I did more work in, in less time or I addressed a, a weakness at the end of my workout that I, I've been, you know, dismissing or a lot of those sorts of things kind of goes back to what Kelly was saying about focus on, on the positive when you can, but so much of that is being aware with your of your sort of internal dialogue, I think, you know, and that's not my field, but it is something I personally try to stay uh, aware of, you know, because you do need to get creative in what your your PRs. Phil Stevens that I do the podcast with uh, Iron Radio, he talks about that quite a bit too. You know, there's there's lots of ways to 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 PR in your lifestyle, but that requires sort of to Kelly's point a, a positive focus. Like, what can I what can I take away from this, you know, to move me in the right direction, I guess. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And that's something, uh, you know, Chad Ikes and I, we used to just email back and forth occasionally. Now we text on a weekly basis. And we kind of have almost become, this is something him and I are going to talk about, almost like <laughs> mental health training partners in a way of we'll bounce ideas off each other and we'll, you know, will you know share little victories with each other and i think there's just a lot of value to that too the same thing in the gym of you know while the average person may not see what are you so excited about you got you know a little better sleep this week or you got you know you dealt with the situation a little better that seems kind of silly somebody else dealing with similar things can appreciate that and kind of keep rooting you on and that's something him and i have found very beneficial and you know we're in totally different arenas different arenas of life i mean he's you know, older than I am, different kind of, uh, different kind of area of life, but we both have this shared, um, passion for training and for trying to improve our mental health. And it's been extremely beneficial. So it's, I think that's something that I, I think a lot of people could really latch to is that self-awareness as they make progress, both in the mental and the physical side. You know, I um, often tell Kelly, if I may, that, uh, 
it, I kind of joke that she's paid to be this neutral, objective sounding board, right? She's yeah. paid to be that third party because it's hard to see some of it when you're in the middle of it. And the benefit of Kelly, and of course she's trained, right? But you know, you can come in and say, you know, tell me about your situation, ask them open ended questions, and then you can see things that they can't always see themselves because you know they're neck deep in it, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I'm um, kind of to the to the point or the topic of this of this combination of this biopsychosocial collectiveness of this whole thing. Um, Kelly, for since you work with addiction, this is something I've been trying to look at and learn more about too. When people talk about uh, addiction as a disease, how do you navigate with your clients discussing with them the balance of like understanding things that may be out of their control versus what's in their control? Because as, as in most things with society, I think we like to fall on one of the spectrum or the other. Like I said, it's like, oh, this is all my fault or, oh, I can't do anything about this. And how do you navigate with them kind of having them not be too hard on themselves but also understanding, like, here's areas that you can take some control over. Oh, first I pull out my mental health magic wand. <laughs> and, and, and then we just, we literally just break it down. Okay, what can you take uh, care of, of right now? We talk about prioritizing um, their goals. They have short-term goals, long-term goals, and all those little steps in between. I use the analogy, you cannot get from the bottom landing of a flight of stairs without hitting every single step in between. Hmm. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And yeah, those it kind of feeds back into that like self-awareness of the little goals and the little victories. Yeah, I think it's I, I think that's something that I struggled with for a long time was trying to find, you know, without feeling like it's too big of a goal to get to that bottom landing of the stairs of like finding the little steps to get there. So that's yeah, it's I'm sure that's a very you know, it's it's not a and, and I think sometimes people have to realize too that I'm sure that process with people for you is not simple or quick. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure too. It's the reason why I said I pull out that mental health magic wand first. <laughs> yeah. That's the other big part, you know, is getting them to realize, listen, these things did not happen overnight. You cannot expect to change them overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take time. And, and then that's the other thing, too. Then you're like, I don't want to take time. It's like, but you have, but you have to. You have to give yourself time to learn what you are capable of doing right now and then what you're capable of doing tomorrow. Every day builds on your successes of the previous day. You know, Kelly, that is so parallel with progression models in resistance mm -hmm. training, right? Nobody's going to expect someone like you're not going to have uh, a, a newbie come in and you're like, okay, here's 315 pounds. Let's see how many reps you can get. You know, you're not going to do that. You're going to have some type of progression model working them at a after you do some assessments right at a certain percentage of their one rm and you're going to periodize and take some deloads some people more than others whatever but it, it's a progression model you don't just jump to squatting 700 pounds there's you know there's the obvious quantitative smaller steps between here and a 700 pound squat you know so i it just sounds so similar to what you're saying yeah definitely yeah definitely the uh well that's the thing that i've that I'm trying to, I've tried to reframe for myself and I've tried to encourage other people, uh, especially that are lifters or athletes or even coaches, when they look at this mental health side of things of like, you have to look at it the way that you look at training in a wise way. You have to look at it as a project, as a journey, as a, as a progressive thing. Like you said, if you try to look at it as like, it's either fixed or it's not fixed, like that's just, you're going to be discouraged and you're going to not want to even start. So it's, yeah, I think it's very important to look at it as like, it's going to be this very progressive, very, and the same way with training adaptation, you know, we look at super compensation and all these things and how training is not linear all the time. You have your ups and downs and the goal is that those ups and downs progress up over time. You have to look at the same way with mental health too, I think of, you know, you're going to have ups and downs, but as long as that line is line is trending 
up over time, then that's huge for you. And I think it's sometimes getting people to realize the value of that. You know, from the biological perspective, it's really not as separate as you might first think. You know, that I almost think that the biopsycho division is it's almost a false dichotomy there because you're just reinforcing it's adaptations. Like you said, you're reinforcing certain pathways of thinking, right? And those literally become larger and physically stronger. These neuronal connections, right? Neuroplasticity and all that. And so it takes time to get those systems in place. You don't just suddenly, I don't know, you're given like Kelly's magic wand, you know, she waves her wand and all of a sudden you're this calm, satisfied, well-adjusted, you know, <laughs> enlightened individual. It's, but the adaptations are, to me, in many ways, physical, too. I think a lot of psychiatry is moving into this more neurology sort of thing. There's all this research about neural mapping and stuff. So I don't even think it's that really different. You and I both know people have different opinions maybe on how much speed work to do or, you know, dynamic kind of explosive movements and this sort of thing. But you're doing those for peripheral neural adaptations and what kelly does with clients is more you know central it's more just um you know you could call it psychology but g but my bias as a physiologist is it's it's sort of structural biology too right you're literally reinforcing these pathways not a motor pathway like a lifter you know down the descending tracks and out the spine to the working muscle but but literally within your brain and i think that's an important thing to think about you have to let yourself adapt and grow and again hence back to that progression model yeah absolutely and i think that's one of the biggest things that i i think with all the different areas we continue to grow and we have great experts out there in the psychiatric and in the mental health and in the counseling and physical training and nutrition i think that's one area that i still see so many people putting way too big of a divide between this is mental this is physical i mean Yes, there's emphasis you put on the approaches to things, but it really, I mean, our nervous system doesn't differentiate, you know, and we see over and over again, the more research that gets done on the, the way stress is collectively adapted to by the, to by the body. And, you know, uh, Brian Mann over at Mizzou did some research recently where they looked at uh, the football players on their team and they found that the most the times of the year when they got injured the most were not during high competition stress times, but actually during high academic stress times. And it's very interesting to see those kind of patterns keep coming up of realizing like, and, and I gave a talk to a coach's clinic last year at Robert Morris and tried to talk to the coaches of, you know, we got to have administrators and coaches and athletes and professionals all realizing like, this is all linked. This is all you don't have your mind here, and then a mile down the road is your body. It's all the same nervous system connects it all. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, talk in the health journalistic realm right now uh, about some work. Actually, it's gone back. It's gone back, I remember, at least as far back as five years ago, that uh, inadequate sleep uh, increases amyloid plaques and can lead to dementia. You know, th that's a good example of something physical leading to something that you might consider, you know, mental, you know, or the flip side of that, like overtraining can induce some pretty serious depression in people. And so, you know, and sleep loss. And uh, again, with the interconnectedness, but I do think it's helpful. Yeah. to You have to dichotomize it a little bit or categorize these things so you can have, like not, no, no one of us can be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about, oh, maybe some more fish oils. Kelly can be like, you know, your meds are affecting your sleep, aren't they? You know, let's talk about that. Tell me how you feel, how well rested you feel. And so Kelly's more about how they feel and how they're thinking about things, that whole cognitive restructuring and where I'm thinking about the sleep and what you eat. Like everybody knows, I think, that fish oils have, that fish oils have antidepressive qualities now or that even that creatine can enhance the effect of antidepressant meds that may not otherwise be working, you know, stuff like that. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, and, you know, I guess to the point, it's all interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And to Kelly, to your work, you know, I think sometimes for athletes, and I saw this in my own life and I see it in a lot of people I talk to, for athletes that are very 
concrete and like to see the progress and like the sets and reps and like the objective side of things. I think a lot of athletes view counseling and psychological uh, strategies as like, oh, this is like the, you know, the wishy-washy mental stuff. But I think sometimes they need to realize that those strategies you teach them literally manifest themselves in physical changes. And I was even listening to um, some people talk the other day of a doctor and a counselor, and they were talking to a counselor, and they were talking about how they did some research that um, people with, I believe it was bipolar, had some different brain uh, blood flow changes, and they found that that counseling with no other interventions actually made changes to the brain. And one of the people that was discussing with them were talking about, oh, see, it was it uh, it w- it was a physical thing. It wasn't a mental thing in the first place. I'm like, no, there. <laughs> it just shows that the mental strategies can literally change your physical body functioning and i think that's you know that's something that's that's so important for people to realize about the value of what you do and do you find that with a lot of the people you work with that sometimes it it takes a little while to get buy in for some of the things you're encouraging them to do oh yeah yeah they're like well i i'm i'm no longer taking this drug everything should be okay well what were your thought? What were your thought patterns? You know, what was going on in your life when you started using, or more towards the community health? You know, still, what was going on in your life when you started noticing these issues? That that's that social environment that's impacting. I mean, it. We can't pull it apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you see with the social aspect, too, um, in talking to some different strength and conditioning coaches, something we were talking about at another conference I was speaking at was the backgrounds that some of these athletes come from. Um, You know, some of these athletes, they come into the college setting of a very high pressure athletic endeavor, both physically and mentally and, and social stress and things like that and academic stress. And they're coming and they're coming from a childhood where they're not being adequately supported. They're not learning mental adaptation strategies. They're not getting social support. Maybe they're even from an economic standpoint, they've been used to growing up in a tough economic situation. They're not getting good nutrition. And I think that even feeds more into what some of the athletes struggle with is they're coming from a position where, you know, they're not necessarily coming with all the tools that, you know, even the simple ones of like they haven't had somebody in their lives telling them they're good or giving them positive feedback. And that's where I think a lot of athletes would benefit from talking to a counselor too is like understanding the role that their past and their social environment has played in their current status. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and I guess kind of to, to wrap up talking about this kind of comprehensive, um, idea of things to touch a little more on that, on that training side of things, Dr. Lowry, and I guess you on the nutrition side too, you know, I think sometimes lifters specifically don't realize the stress that both nutrition and training habits put on their body. And I think, you know, I want to say maybe like 10 years ago, I think there was like a trend of a lot of articles going around about like everybody feeling like their CNSs were fried and they had adrenal fatigue and all these things. So then the response was kind of swinging to the other side of like, oh, everybody's just being sissies. But I think there's value to people understanding that, yes, like your nervous system, when you put 400 pounds on your back, your nervous system is affected by that. And how much do you see in, in, the, thing, in, in the things that you've studied and just work with on a daily basis, the effects collectively on the body that nutrition and training has on the body and stress? Well, I think it, it's helpful to, to recognize that there are different types of overreaching and overtraining. I mean, Dr. Andy Fry years ago really separated out sympathetic type overtraining, uh, which is an excess of intensity, really, that a lot of lifters experience versus the parasympathetic type of overtraining that a lot of endurance runners get. You know, typically, I think the lay public thinks 
uh, overtraining is exhaustion like you might see in a runner. You know, they're depleted and emaciated and those sorts of things. But uh, I'd have to go back and actually look at some of uh, uh, Dr. Fry's studies. But I think he had undergrads doing 10 one rep maxes a day for two weeks. Oh, man. <laughs> they can't turn off the adrenaline, right? Yeah. So the their adrenals, like, so they, <laughs> they manifest things like sleep disturbances. They can't get to sleep when they lay down at night. You know, things like that. Um, some of them, because coupled with the sleep disturbances, they might be disturbances. They might become sort of carbohydrate intolerant, especially if they're leaning on dietary stimulants in different ways, coupled with the sleep loss, you know, things like that. So uh, that's where I see a lot of this come into play. And I think you're right. A lot of lifters, and again, to, to the point about social too, it depends on who your gym bros are, you know, and, and, the magazines you're exposed to and everything else, you know, this whole, you know, um, squat till you puke, you know, sleep is for when you're dead kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that whole excessive mantra. Um, so there are, there's very real body of literature out there. There's whole books. One of them, uh, researchers like Ken Ta and Kelman, uh, there's one book called enhancing recovery. It's totally academic and I'm such a nerd to admit this, but I read it almost cover to cover. It's about self-assessment through simple paper and pencil questionnaires about overreaching and overtraining. So if you're feeling depressed or anxious in different ways, different ways, it could actually be your training uh, that's affecting this because you're overdoing it. You know, you're ending up with some degree of sympathetic or parasympathetic overtraining. And that affects things like anxiety and depression and you know, all manner of things, it affects your brain biochemistry, you know, just like drugs affect your brain biochemistry. So does lack of sleep or, um, or, or the type of foods you eat, you know, so, uh, like appetite, there was a paper came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, it was sort of a double paper on how higher sodium diets, uh, increase appetite by 20 to 30%. Well, if you know that you might be able to use that to your advantage, you know, if you're trying to gain weight, but the flip side is that can be very difficult when you, you know, you follow societal trends with fast food and canned foods and convenience foods. And, you know, you're trying to control your, your comp body comp, you know, your weight. And you don't realize that, that the sleep could be actually, I'm sorry, the sodium could be affecting your appetite, you know, and all these other things affect your gut bacteria as well. And that's constantly getting attention these days. So, and, and people may not realize how much those things affect your mood. But one of my star students last year, uh, that's one of his foci as he's going into graduate school, as he's studying microbiome changes and how they affect decision making. You wouldn't think the bacteria in your large intestines could manipulate your mood. Um, but again, whether it's sodium or junk food, you know, causing these changes in your gut, again, it, it takes weeks to make some of these things start to change probably, but they do influence your mental state. You know, I always tell Kelly, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to me, what she does by itself without addressing stuff like physical activity or nutrition, it's like trying to plant flowers and experience plant flowers in a spoiled garden. You know, the biochemistry of the soil is off and it's really hard. I mean, ask yourself, I mean, almost any listeners probably experienced a hangover at some point when you're feeling like that the next morning, are you in a really good state to start to make some positive changes and think about things right? No, you're probably not. So you, you think about that, like in Kelly's clientele with, with people with, struggling with a drug addiction and stuff, their brain chemistry from lifestyle and, and illicit drugs or even the prescription drugs. It's, it's not perfect. And so, it, you know, it's very tough. And, of course, you need the cognitive, the talk therapy. But at the same time, as, as a, a physiologist, I think about the, uh, the biochemistry of the soil so you can plant the flower, you know. Absolutely. And this is something that we could talk a little bit more um, on the Iron Radio podcast for lifters, too. But I think, I think lift power lifters – tend to put themselves in, a, themselves in a perfect storm of those variables where you have somebody who's training very heavy all the time, so they're constantly in that sympathetic overreaching state. They eat like crap, so they're constantly dealing with systemic inflammation or that bad gut biome, which has the effects on mental state. 
And then a lot of them, because cardio is so silly to, uh, to powerlifters sometimes, they have very bad uh, aerobic capacity, which is shown to, to have a bad effect on the ability to switch out of the sympathetic state. So you have this like perfect storm. And then if on top of that, your mental strategies of the way you think and approach things and that cognitive side of things that Kelly, that you work with, it's like this perfect storm where, you know, I look at where I was a couple years ago and you go, man, well, no wonder things were, were not in a good place because systemically you're stacking the cards against yourself. And it's just very interesting to see that. And something that, and I'll talk more about this too, but from a training programming standpoint, something that we've been, because you mentioned the, the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic overreaching, something that I've been playing with with myself and with other lifters that I work with and give just kind of feedback to um, is looking at people who are dealing with mental health conditions that looking at pushing low to moderate percentage work, um, being the ability to push those volume, that volume harder without having as many negative effects to mental health symptoms as pushing the higher percentage and higher intensity sets. And I keep seeing this pattern, this is completely anecdotally, but something I'd like to look more into in the future, where it seems like everybody I talk to and for myself that you can train hard but if you can stay under a strength, under a certain percentage relative to your absolute strength, you can still train hard without it negatively affecting that side of your mental health symptoms. But it, to over and over again, the people that I see getting over that 95 percentage range too often, immediately you see sleep decline, you see mental health symptoms uh, increase and things like that. So it's really interesting to look at specific programming interventions to, to try and help improve mental health too. And it's, you know, as I'm sure you know, it's like the, the nerd in me is always trying to look at like what kind of studies you can create to look at this, but it's uh, yeah, it's this big experiment that constantly have to be looking at all of the variables. Well, it's interesting, but we just got done this spring collecting a lot of data on uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? So essentially adrenal secretion, uh, not just, but mostly, and how coffee, how coffee affects that. But I'll tell you, Terry Graham, uh, who's a Canadian uh, exercise physiologist, really senior level guy, um, he's looked at that kind of stuff for years. And when I would look at some of the data about when you couple caffeine or coffee with training, um, much to your point, uh, some of the studies where he pushed people to failure and uh, sort of like you're saying, a lot of power lifters, if you're working, if you're even approximating, approximating a 90% of your one rep max in your training, uh, that's kind of the, the stuff that he would do. When he would push people to exhaustion or very high intensity kind of exertions, that's where you really saw the exaggerated epinephrine release, adrenaline release, right? And whereas if they would keep it a little bit calmer, I mean, let's face it, you don't really cross a lot of these neuroendocrine thresholds uh, for cortisol or different stress hormones until you're probably over 60% or 60% or so. So it's a good point to what you're saying. I mean, if you want to add volume, I mean, volume times intensity, that's the killer, you know, but if you wanted to do a little bit lighter intensity stuff and do more volume phase, I think that might actually be an advantage uh, to a lot of lifters, again, because they're not crossing these exaggerative stress hormone thresholds. You know, it's not just linear, slow increase. It's kind of a threshold. And if you can keep things below 60%, I can tell you, I can point to literature that you don't turn on, you know, the, the secretion of certain stress hormones. And like I said, Terry Graham would say, when you couple that with coffee and caffeine, you really see that exaggerated effect on adrenaline secretion uh, when things get really crazy intense. And to your point, that's what powerlifters do. That's that perfect storm, right? They they have coffee or a pre workout or something. They go absolutely, you know, ball busting in the gym, and that's what they're doing to themselves. They're doing to themselves. They're, the extreme, you know, um, adrenaline secretion kind of thing. Absolutely, and I think those are some areas I'm going to go more into in the future. And then, yeah, I mean, you see these lifters training really heavy, taking all this pre workout, and then you throw on top of that. And I'm going to have a separate 
uh, a separate interview to go into this topic more, but this is something a lot of people don't talk about too, is the effects of performance enhancing drugs like steroids and different hormones on that too. And, you know, there's a lot of power lifters and like a lot of things that are, that are illegal. They don't, t they become taboo to talk about. So people don't address them as variables, but there's a lot of, even though there's not as much research on lifters and anabolics and things on those effects, uh, Dr. Serran Eric Serrano has been sending me a lot of research recently on different lifters and some things they've looked at with anabolic steroids. And uh, it's definitely a variable that, that you have to look at. If, if, you're dealing with mental if you're dealing with mental health concerns and then you look at the training, the supplementation of things like stimulants, and then on top of that you throw in some different hormone adjustments by, you know, anabolics and, you know, uh, things like that. It's, it's, uh, yeah, you're just, you're just throwing a lot of variables all in the blender, if you will. <laughs> and, um, and yeah. it's something that we're going to talk a little bit more about in the future too. So it's, it's very interesting. You know, I can, I can predict that Eric will almost, Dr. Serrano will almost certainly tell you that about the depression that happens when people come off of an androgen cycle. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen guys, who would explain to me what they were using and that sort of thing years ago and then say, you know, I just sort of went off cold turkey and I was weeping at work. I felt like a fool, like, you know, maladjusted because the depression, again, almost biochemically was so overwhelming. And I think it's one of the things that doesn't get a lot of attention. You get a lot of attention. You, you look at studies about how your HDL, your good cholesterol will go down with certain meds and then they'll, it'll rebound after a cycle and, but people don't talk about the crushing depression. So if you get a chance, I'd love to hear what um, what Eric has to say about that because I almost guarantee he'd corroborate some of that, right? If he works with athletes that have um, abused anabolics, uh, that's one of the things that you see. Uh, some of the – it might be mildly euphoric while you're on and there's some mania involved maybe or certain things like that. But when people come off, especially when they do it abruptly, uh, I think the depression can be devastating. Absolutely. And yeah, that's something that him and I are going to, we're working on matching up our schedules to talk about soon. So, and that's the goal, you know, kind of as we wrap this up today, that I just want to hopefully get coaches and athletes and lifters and <clears throat> even professionals in different arenas to look at what you guys have essentially been preaching this, we've been preaching this biopsychosocial, collective, comprehensive idea of treat the whole person. And if you're a lifter and you're dealing with some struggles and some stuff, look at everything. Don't let one area sit off to the side and don't address it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to kind of preach with this podcast and hopefully give people, you know, obviously no level of what we talk about can is all the tools out there, but hopefully give just enough of a taste of all these different areas that people see, oh man, maybe I need to talk to somebody about this or this and and hopefully you see the benefit of that. So I, I really appreciate you both taking the time today to talk about this. I know these are very broad reaching topics and are very, you know, it's hard to sometimes kind of nail down what direction we want to talk about. But I think through the conversation today, hopefully people see the interconnectedness between what both of you do and the importance of both of those things, both of those things. So whether somebody has only been looking at the cognitive behavior change side of things or the counseling side of things or has only been looking at the physical physiology side of things hopefully after this they see hmm, maybe i need to look at the other side too yeah it doesn't have to be a tree hugger sort of hippie-esque you know um holistic wellness kind of i'm not necessarily bashing those things the truth is that is the reality of it but I like to look at it from an evidence-based perspective. You know, yep. what does science have to say about CBT, like Kelly does, or something like fish oils or protein intake or, you know, uh, you know those sorts of things, and then get some crosstalk among the professions instead of just pretending that it's this big, like I said, almost subjective, hippie-esque kind of thing. It's not hippie. Uh, no. The interconnectedness is very much science-based. I mean, the neuroendocrine system is a very solid Obvious, affected, obvious connection between your mental state and your physical state. You know, the way you think affects how stressed you feel or things like that or depression affects hormone release. And then there, that subsequently affects your physicality. You know, so it's not hippie. It's real. 
and we need to make referrals among the the experts and get some crosstalk so you don't have something like the classic psychiatrist who just says pill for the ill you know and not that all psychiatrists do that but they they think so pharmaceutically that they don't think about uh, you know the uh, talk therapy or the nutrition and stuff as well that's a very good point i'm glad you i'm glad you uh, emphasize that of yeah this is all we're both, you know, all of us are, are here are evidence-based, science-focused people. And I think it's, I was under a misconception for a long time that it was very like hippie-ish out there, kind of the psychological side of things. And, and no, there's evidence there. And especially as your point earlier, as neuroscience, neuroscience continues to become a bigger part of this, we're seeing that the building blocks are out there and they're evident and they're very clear. So yeah, it's... Um, I would just encourage everybody listening, don't feel like, you know, this is just you going out on a limb to see if you can get in, you know, do some tree hugging or whatever. It's like, there's a lot of evidence here and there's a lot of researchers that are now starting to talk and, inter you know, collaborate and see where these dots connect. So, um, yeah, that's a very good point too. And I, uh, I appreciate both of you again, talking today about all these topics. I know it's quite a bit of, uh, different arenas to go and in, in, uh, sometimes having two completely different disciplines on at the same time can be difficult. But I think, uh, I think this is a really good conversation today. And I look forward to talking with hopefully both of you more in the future. And um, Kelly, I may have some questions in the future as I pursue getting um, my other masters in counseling too. So I may, I may reach out to you again. Okay, good luck to you on that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, again, thank you to both of you for taking the time to do this. And I look forward to um, talking more in the future. Cool. Thanks, Joel. Absolutely. Thanks.